Welcome back. We're here for part two of Record of the Day with Christian Frommelt. Uh, from Melt. Get it. Whatever. I mean, I've heard you say it and your family say it different ways. I'm just going to cover my cover my bases here. Um, we're back on part two, and and uh, this is Eddie Condon, and I'm going to talk about this during it, but just so we're here, this is Carnegie Drag and Carnegie Jump. And as I start this, the reason uh, it would appear they are called that is because it's recorded the day after Benny Goodman's Carnegie Hall concert in 1938. So that was January 16th. It was a Sunday. This was recorded on Monday, January 17th. With a handful of the same musicians playing very different music. So this is Carnegie Drag, and this is Jess Stacy on piano. And I was reading the back of this during the break. Nice. Good Chicago style. Uh, apparently Jess Stacy wasn't gonna make this recording. And then the, the owner of the record label had some words with Benny Goodman, and all of a sudden Jess Stacy was free on Monday. That's all they say. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. That's a classic tea garden structure. Mm -hmm. of them taking a solo on a blues. Make like, it up a tune. Quite a few of the other Eddie Condon recordings. Yeah. And Jack Teagarden and Bud Freeman recordings. Yeah. yeah technically, this song is uh, attributed to just Stacey, Eddie Condon, and Bud Freeman as composers, but I don't know that you can really do that. Is this still Bobby Hackett on trumpet? Uh, on the cornet, but yes. Cornet. Nice. Yeah. I really like Bobby Hackett. I do too, actually. And this this group of folks played together a lot, mm -hmm. even into the 50s and 60s, because I have some yeah. Bobby Hackett like jam session that features Condon and Stacy and T-Garden. I don't think I give Pee Wee Russell enough credit in my everyday life. He's amazing. This is so good. Just like swinging, but just a bit unhinged yeah. as well in a really cool way. It kind of feels like you're about to lose it all the time. <laughs> yeah, man. George Wetling on drums is great too. I don't know too much about him, but all the old drummers I talk to would be like, you need to know more about George Wetling. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I don't think we can really say they composed that song, but it was great. <laughs> uh, this comes Carnegie Jump, which is gonna be like... I think it's just solos on rhythm changes things. <laughs> Probably easy money for them. Yeah. Well, in, in what I was reading here, they were talking about how hard it was to get everyone together to record because everybody was busy in those different groups that I was talking about. And so I think they didn't really have time to rehearse. It was get together and do what we can. Right. I think a lot of it, a lot of what was going on that way, unless you were an individual at your desk, at your piano composing, a lot of collaborations were like that. I know I've been yeah. reading about Andy Razoff and he had to like track Fats Waller down 
and get him at a piano for like 20 minutes so they could write tunes like Honeysuckle Rose and stuff like oh, that. Wow. Jeez. I mean, I can't imagine that Fats particularly was eager to sit down and write things down. No. He seemed a little more busy living life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not that like writing music isn't living life. I don't want to throw that at all my like composer and arranger friends. No, he was out. <laughs> he, he was out doing his thing. I read that uh, like some collectors, because he had to play, pay alimony from from his first uh, marriage. And he was playing organ, I think it was at the Lincoln Theater, and some collectors came in, and he just left the organ in the middle of the gig and ran out of the building. Oh man, that's so good. And it's like, when you think of Fats Waller and like the Sappies and stuff, you have a certain image. And when you think of that, you think of a whole other side of his life that he was leaving. Yeah, I think that dude had maybe one of the most interesting lives that we know very little of. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, this is just another tune of them just going to town. Yeah, I love it. All those That's- little tags and endings and like add-ons i feel like like they are the masters of all of that all absolutely oh and just the the vibrancy that they can introduce with just like yeah a simple form or a blues pattern you know is totally pretty astounding uh this is a tune this we've now left that recording day in the carnegie hall reference so uh this is November 12th, 1938, and this is California Here I Come. Same group, same musicians, just a couple months later. I guess like 10 months later. Never heard this song like this. I know like the Boswell sisters version and like some other kind of cheesy promo versions. Yeah. Like novelty versions, I guess. They're really, really loose with it. I like it. Yeah. It almost doesn't sound like California. Right I know. Now. For a second I was like. Oh. And I, I like the tempo too. It's a little more laid back than usual. Yeah, totally. But I think this this group of guys, all these Chicago musicians, like they have this ability to make songs that don't sound like the songs they're actually are. Yeah. You know? I feel like they're more concerned about like doing what they want with the form than making it the best version of California Here I Come. Yeah. Well they by this time they probably played this song like ten thousand times. Thousand, yeah. <laughs> Oh, this is... And they don't step on each other's toes. Yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny to think of that by this time, they had already been playing professionally for like over 15 years. Yeah. And it's only 1938. Yeah, we're at like the peak of it, and they're 15 years in. Yeah. How wild is that gotta be? But I mean, imagine how like... George Wedling on drums got a little excited at the end there, and I liked it. Uh, but like, think how like uh, uh, George Snowden felt in like 38 and 40, when Frankie's out going filming Hell's a Poppin', and he's like, 
What happened to me, guys? Yeah. Like, I want to know what Shorty George was doing in, like, 1943. That's a good question. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's out there. Oh, this song is called Sunday. I actually do hear the melody. <laughs> yeah. For the first time on this side, there's a melody being played. You know, a lot of tunes in my head have, like, a, a, a an iconic version, you know? Like, for dancers only, is always going to be, like, the Jimmy Lunsford one, you know? Like, and, and this... I can't think of a version of Sunday that, like, defines Sunday. I think of Cliff Edwards singing it. Mm. But I, I can't say that's, like, a definitive version. It's just but, like, for that you, really that like. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, and I'm not saying my definitive is everyone else's, you know. Yes, you are. No, I'm just... <laughs> no like for I, I would say the the stuff Smith by Blue Heaven is always yeah. like my iconic one. I know there's a lot of other great ones that I know by heart, but like that one for me right. is. Oof! Yeah, Jack. another one of those tunes it's written by four people uh <laughs> i don't have first names i have cone stein kruger and miller i wonder does it say when when it was composed no it's just got a recording date um i'm sure somewhere the internet has where the song sunday was composed and when Cause it's it's funny when there's <laughs> so nice. Okay, nineteen twenty-six. Twenty-six. Yeah. Sorry. Written by Chester Kahn, with lyrics by three other people. Stein, Kruger, and Miller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's funny because so often whoever was uh, publishing it or whatever, yeah. they just tacked their name on the end. Like Clarence Williams did that with so many songs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, growing up in Nashville, I would hear that all the time. But like country music stars would take songwriter songs and change like one line and then take a co writing credit. Yeah. It's crappy. Uh, so we've flipped now to the Bud Freeman gang. Oh, yeah. that happened fast, sorry. Um, this is, I have to say it, life, because life is in quotes. Life spears a jitterbug. Uh, Whatever that means. It looks like it's actually in part written by the head of Commodore. Uh, our, our good friend, Milk Gobbler. Maybe it was the same thing we were just talking about. Maybe. Maybe Gobbler was like, yeah, I wrote some of this. I wrote some of this, because there is another guy, there's a, a king that's also listed, but I don't know who it is. Uh, so this band is a lot of the same people, but a different leader. So this is Bud Freeman tenor sax, uh, Bobby Hackett cornet, Pee Wee Russell clarinet, Dave Matthews on alto sax of, of the, the Dave, Dave Matthews, Matthews band. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh god, that never gets old. Uh, Eddie Condon on guitar, obviously. Uh, Jess Stacy piano, Artie Shapiro bass, Dave Tuff on drums, and we have no trombone at all now. A little sad for me. Yeah, I think this might be one of those songs that, like, some guy was like, I wrote some of this, and I've bought it, and it's mine, and you will record it for my label. Yep. It's not a bad song, though. It's great. It's got a very, um, kind of swing-walky feel to it. Yeah. You know? 
Mm -hmm. I'm not going to swing out hard to this. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's <laughs> It's so loose what they're playing. I, I, uh, I've been recording a lot of these lately, and this is the loosest one I've listened to yet. And it's like, <laughs> it's really jarring right now after some like really tight arrangements. Yeah, I think that's what characterizes this group of musicians in particular is how much they were just jamming out, like even from the early '30s. Yeah. I think that's kind of what that, that Chicago style, you know, whatever, what defines that for me is that there's gonna be at least one point where everybody's just kind of soloing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it works, because they all know their parts, like their roles. Right. Uh, but like, th there's not gonna be parts. There's gonna be have fun. And yeah, uh, this is Memories of You. And if anyone's super curious, this was recorded July 12th, 1938. I was I curious. It. Well, you can celebrate its 82nd anniversary in a few months. <laughs> Woohoo! Maybe 82nd... 82nd? Is that right? I'm not up for math. 78th? I think I did that backwards. Either way, yeah. Uh, if you want to celebrate the anniversary of this recording of Memories of You, set a calendar alert. We we'll call it Memories of This Song. Memories of Memories of You. <laughs> yeah, Memories of Memories of You. <laughs> and then the next year we'll do Memories of Memories of Memories of You. <laughs> and so on and so forth. We should, I should release this exactly on July 12th, just so we're celebrating properly. And you should put your name as one of the composers. <laughs> memories of memories of you from Old Tigers. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Oh, God. Tweak this word over here, tweak this chord yeah. over here. Oh, B flat? No, 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 no. It's C now. <laughs> I wrote this song. <laughs> It's G minor. <laughs> Even this, it's just, here's the form, have a solo. It's so nice. It's easy to listen to, is what I really like, actually. Like, it may not make for great television, but it's easy to just, like, kind of just go with this music and not worry about it. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. I feel like that's kind of how they played anyway. Yep. Oh, this was composed by Andy Rizoff and UB Blake in 1930. Oh, thanks for being the official Googler of the episode. <laughs> Yeah, I was just curious. It's actually from uh, Lou Leslie's Blackbirds of 1930. Of course. Another forgotten Broadway show, I'm guessing. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Do you think these musicians went to these Broadway shows and were like, that one, that one, just picking out tunes? Or do you think it just kind of like entered the, the musical consciousness at the same time? I think it was probably just intertwined with what people wanted to hear yeah. from bands. And I guess that kind of still happens with certain movies and stuff, but yeah, not like, nearly the same way. I realized as I asked that question how unanswerable it was. <laughs> <laughs> like, Christian, explain to me why things get popular. <laughs> explain human nature to me, if you would. Uh, I'm this sure... Is What's the use, by the way? Sorry. That answers your question. What's the use? <laughs> but I think it was probably a super easy way for um, people to capitalize on a song from a production that people enjoyed. Yeah, I'm sure. 
I mean, as long as it was a popular show. I don't remember who I was um, posed to this question, but someone put it in my head. It's, it's an interesting idea that like all these bands recorded the same songs. There's there's 300 recordings of the song Sunday, and you know a hundred of them are by the same band, and or you know the same tempo, the same style, the same length, and, and people just don't do that nowadays. Like you don't hear other people. You, I, you call it cover bands today, but it's it's not the same thing. God. Yeah, I guess to me that's what keeps jazz as more of a folk tradition. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it is interesting that that was the expectation. Like there was there was a sort of chorus of people. Uh, creating music there were the composers who just wrote the music yeah and then there were people who made compelling versions or performances of it and uh we only have like a portion of that today it's interesting yeah totally i feel like there was also more focused then because there was less happening so if you got on, like, if, if you managed, like, Benny Goodman's band got on the radio and got famous on the West Coast, you know, like, I feel like if it hadn't been for that show or that thing, they wouldn't have, like, it could have been Jeff Stacy instead of Benny Goodman. Who knows? Yeah. Or for Fletcher Henderson to, like, he was not, uh, the persona that most people would choose to have. So it, it was like sort of by chance and like your connections and yeah, yeah, yeah. all these things that were kind of by chance. And nothing has really changed. <laughs> well. So in the end, what's the use? Uh, so this is our last tune. Uh, and this is tapping at the Commodore Till. And I just want to, since we're talking about who's writing these songs, this song was written by Gobbler and The Bunch. I, 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 let's see if I can zoom in enough. Gobbler and The Bunch. What? So Gobbler was the owner of the Commodore, and I feel like it's kind of like Life Spears a Jitterbug, where he's just like... I'm gonna write some things. It's for my group. It's a f here you go. Wait, what's this dude's name? Uh, Milt Gobbler. G A B L E R. Gobbler. I hardly know her. Sorry. It's a weird cannibalism joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was the owner of the Commodore Music Shop, which be uh, uh, in my. Uh, Brief reading became the Commodore recording album label. All of this is written by Milk Gobbler. Yeah, I was I had no idea who this Milk Gobbler guy was until we put this record on. No. Or George Brunis, who was uh, lusty but undistinguished. <laughs> Oh, actually, they, going back to side one, when I said this is stuff Tea Garden has sung a lot, right here, Tea Garden sang one of his standard blues, and Gobbler called it "Serenade to a Shylock." Yeah, who is this guy? Did he just it, own a record store and become like a man of power? I guess so. He's like the whitey of the record industry. His shop was on 52nd Street, so just by proximity, mm. he probably got a lot of uh, business. I wonder if his, it was like the record shop in the neighborhood that everybody went to. Could be. Well, now we have homework to do. Like, this is really nice. 
Oh, wow. He produced Flying Home. Lionel Hampton's Flying Home. Really? Yeah. So this is kind of like the beginning. Like what we just listened to is sort of like the beginning of his meddling in the in the record world. That's amazing. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I have not read all of this. I've been trying to skim it as we go. The whole first two columns are actually written by uh, Gobbler. And so I'll, I'll, I'll do some reading and maybe I'll add some notes when this gets posted and we'll, we'll, we'll catch it all up. But yeah. Cool. Hilarious. Um, yeah, that's it. That's the end of the album. We finished it. Thanks for doing this. Good one. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a uh, pleasure. Any, any final thoughts coming from you? And, and, and also plug your things. Oh, yeah. Uh, like everyone else and their grandma, I've created a Patreon where I'll be doing mostly solo jazz and some things related to St. Louis Shag, but uh, mostly something to keep me occupied, keep me active, keep me uh, creating some nice content. So... You, uh, you, you could spend some of this time creating that content of some of those St. Louis shag films that you've seen that nobody else has, and you could, you know, start releasing those. That's, that's part of the no goal, yeah. No pressure or anything. No, I, I do want to incorporate some of the interviews, but it's uh, really, it's, it's, a, it's just a lot to curate is oh, the big I, problem. I but uh, now I'm, I'm trying to turn my attention to making yeah. that happen. No, that was me just throwing you under the bus on the internet for my own. No, I, I want it too. It's, it's in the works. I'll definitely be um, starting with newspaper clippings and thoughts. Oh, and very cool. Like that. But really yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for doing this. Make sure you follow Christian on uh, Patreon or you can find more info on uh, your Facebook or your, your Instagram or all the things. Uh, other than that, thanks for doing this. This was uh, a really fun time, and now I have homework to do. So yeah, same. I'm extra excited. Oh, awesome. it was a good time. Thanks, man. It was thanks great for seeing out. you. And yeah, thanks too. for listening to Record of the Day, everybody. Bye.